So today I will share with you some of the unique um, features or unique possibilities that we have with the uh, process of electron beam melting. Um, and today I would like to show with you um, an uh, overview of the EBM process so we do get an understanding how that works before we go into what makes the EBM process unique and how it differs from other AM technologies and, and also give a background to, to how that will affect uh, the materials. Well, then I will then show you some of the conventional materials that are available today with EBM before we uh, moving over to the interesting part with the uh, material opportunities that are present with this technology. And then I will end everything up with an industrial uh, example of advanced material use with this technology. So before we dig into the technology, I would like to just briefly introduce G Additive. So G Additive is what we call an ecosystem of additive manufacturing, where we do have products range ranging all over the um, the additive manufacturing value chain. So as for for printing technologies, G Additive is unique. That is offered both uh, laser based uh, additive part of that additive manufacturing as well as EBM based uh, part of that additive manufacturing as well as binder jet uh, additive manufacturing. But also the, the organization offers uh, powder and consultancy services and software to, to help the additive ecosystem. So moving into the um, EBM process and how that works. So EBM is uh, very much like uh, the laser-based powder bed processes. The major difference is that we, instead of a laser beam as an energy source, uses an electron beam. Um, we spread the powder out like the laser-based processes do, but then instead use an electron to melt this powder. The electron beam is generated from a crystal, a hybrid brightness crystal, uh, where we can have beam powers ranging from 50 to 6,000 watts uh, in today's uh, systems. That should be compared to the laser-based system that usually use uh, single lasers of up to one kilowatt. So here we have six kilowatts instead. Um, the EBM is uh, fully adjustable as it comes to what we called uh, focus or full width half max, we could, which could also be referable to as the spot size. And to control the beam, this technology uses a coil package, which is uh, consisting of electromagnetic lenses. So that means that there's no moving parts um, in this technology. So it's electromagnetic fields that controls the beam so that the beam can be controlled very rapidly. So uh, we usually say that EBM is where scanning electron microscope meet EBM welding. And I will explain that, um, that sentence uh, during my presentation here. I really do hope the everybody's internet connections are strong enough so that you can follow along with this video here that describes how the process works. So we start with raking out powder over the layer, so spreading the powder out. Then what the EBM is unique for is that it preheats the powder uh, to, a, um, to a certain degree. Then there's the counter melting with what appears to be several beams. I will explain this in just a second how that works. And then finally, we have the bulk melting of the actual uh, properties of the part and then the process repeats so I think we'll have another look again so you can you can see what actually happening here so we're once again raking the layer then the preheating um, to a preset process temperature predetermined process temperature and once again the contours and finally we once again go for the bulk melting of the actual parts so my idea here is to try to answer the question, what makes EBM unique uh, as an additive manufacturing process? And the major difference we have already touched upon. So we use 
electrons as an energy carrier compared to laser or photons. So this makes that we, uh, so first of all, the electrons have a deeper penetration depth. So since it's particles, it will actually, uh, it will actually uh, penetrate the surface and, and, and integrate with the powder particles and, and leave the energy deeper down into the powder particle compared to, to photons with a laser that is usually only absorbed on the very, very surface of this powder. Um, also, since electrons are particles, um, the reflectivity is not an issue with electron beams since we have uh, the, the energy transfer deeper down in the material uh, rather than the surfaces. And that also makes that we have lower evaporation from the surfaces since we have the temperature distributed uh, deeper down into the actual material that we're melting. The energy efficient is also very high, so it's it's um, it's up over 75% uh, of the ele electron energy is transferred into heat or into the material for for the material titanium 64 as we can see here. And in theory, you can have beam power as well, uh, all the way up to 10 kilowatts. Um, compared to, to much lower uh, with photon-based production systems. Um, we earlier saw the, the contour melting of the electron beam melting, and this is actually, it, and it appears from the video that we had several beams uh, mo uh, scanning the area at once. This is actually not the case. So since we do not have any physical moving lenses in the electron beam system, it's possible to actually to deflect the beam very rapidly. So the tra traveling speed of the electron beam can be up to 8,000 meters per second. And uh, giving the build volume or the build envelope that we have, you could basically move the beam stochastically over, over the build area. And by moving the beam extremely rapidly, it's possible to maintain several melt pools alive at the same time. So what appears to be several beams scanning the area it's actually just one beam but it moves so rapidly so the naked eye can only the naked eye will detect this as several beams but it's actually several melt pools that could be uh, that is alive at the same time so in this process we're able to maintain up to 70 melt pools active at the same time uh, as we scan the beam very fast and by doing so, you can you can tailor the amount of energy that you put into a specific position uh, at the build envelope. So as you can see here in the image, so a low beam energy will of course lower the productivity, but it will improve the surfaces. So that's why we use this this type of of scenario on the actual contours. And then once we need to go in and build and melt the, the bulk part of it, and utilize that increased amount of energy we have with the electron beam. Uh, we go with one single melt pool, which, where we put in a lot more energy into that. Um, another feature, unique feature with the electron beam melting system is that we have a vacuum environment. This is actually a prerequisite for the process to work. So uh, once again, uh, having electron as energy carriers be particles, if we should have an atmosphere in the build chamber the electrons would actually scatter on the uh, atmospheric uh, atoms. So we would not be able to control the beam. So instead we use utilize a vacuum and this is to, to, to avoid influence on the beam, as I said. Uh, we also introduce a low amount of helium. So this is not a gas flow as you have in the laser based system. This is only small amounts of helium and we're still under a vacuum pressure. So usually down to 10 to the minus three millibars in, in pressure in the chamber. And the helium helps to control the uh, electron charge up uh, of the powder particles that we're trying to melt. Then of course, having a vacuum will secure the, uh, the environment and maintain a good chemical composition of the material that, that, uh, that we're printing. But then there are some benefits to this as well. And of course, uh, the vacuum will act as an excellent thermal isolation. 
I will explain why this is a benefit on the next slide. Uh, but one one thing that that is that is from this is a better material quality. I've also mentioned this already. We have we will have uh, excellent cleanliness, uh, weight low reaction, and, and contamination of the actual material that we're printing. And then, of course, once it comes to any type of voids that might be introduced uh, in the process can be eliminated with hot isostatic pressing. And this is because the voids or defects in the electron beam melting process is totally empty since we do have vacuum, a vacuum environment. So there's no gas inside the pores, which makes them easy to compress. Another unique feature uh, with EBM is that we have an elevated build, build temperature. This is actually due once again to the fast moving electron beam and also the excellent energy transfer of the electron beam, which makes it possible to very rapidly and efficiently heat the complete build chamber or the build envelope with the electron beam. Um, once again, since we have the vacuum, that will act as an insulator, and that makes it that the process is very prone to, to being able to be preheated to a surrounding stable temperature. Um, and of course, this makes the process, the material faster to melt as you have a increased, surf, increased build temperature from the start, so you do not need to go from all the way from room temperature to melting temperature. Here we usually go from, from an elevated temperature somewhere between 600 to 1100 degrees centigrade. Um, by having a, a surrounding uh, elevated temperature will minimize or actually for some materials actually completely remove any residual stresses in the material. So once the material comes out of the machine, there's no need to do any post heat treatment to remove any residual stresses that has been built up during the process. And you can all, you're can you also able to control the, the microstructure that you get out of the, the process uh, to have a full developed microstructure depending on how you set up this, this uh, build temperature. And of course, an elevated temperature will improve the, um, the weldability of some uh, hard to weld material, as we will come into later on in this presentation. I earlier said that EBM is basically a crossover between scanning electron microscopy and electron beam welding. So coming back to the scanning electron beam, uh, scanning electron microscopy. So since we have electron beams and using them as our as our melting source we are also get the same type of signals that you do get from a scanning electron microscope. So we do get X-ray signals, we do get uh, backscattered signals that you can utilize to do advanced analysis of your process. You can measure the surface topology, you can in theory also measure the, the chemistry of the parts in, in each single uh, pixel or, or voxel of the material that you're printing so that, that we have capability to have very close process control. And once again, coming to you, to the utilization of the fast moving electron beam, it's possible with EBM to, to tailor the material properties uh, on a local level. So we saw this to some parts from the presentation from Edward this morning where he said that you can control the electron, uh, sorry, the microstructure with LPBF technologies. Uh, with EBM, you instead utilize the, the, the fast control of the electron beam, everything from power to focus and also the, the location of the beam. And by scanning the beam very rapidly, it's possible to, in a very accurate way, control the solidification rate and thermal gradients of your material uh, and as you can see, you can get this controlled microstructure here on the left. So this is a titanium based material where you actually can see that we have the former Arkham logo uh, imprinted in, into as a microstructure into this material. So this is a very, very unique and, and I would say a very cool way to utilize additive manufacturing in the future. 
So I would like to mention the materials that are uh, available as what we call production materials as of today in the G additive or MEBM systems. Uh, what we call production materials are materials that are validated uh, with guaranteed material properties coming out of the machine. Um, the bread and butter here is titanium 64 or titanium grade 5 or 23. Um, titanium based material used for both aerospace and medical uh, application applications and it's basically due to the um, to the um, the market needs from those uh, market segments uh, that was actually the, the main driver of additive manufacturing from the beginning uh, other available materials are alloy 718 uh, nickel based super alloy uh, we, which having excellent oxi oxidation and corrosion resistance and, and is used for high temperature applications. Uh, cobalt chromium is also material available mainly for, um, for medical um, applications, medical applications with, with uh, a need for more wear resistance. And then finally, uh, uh, we have titanium aluminide, which is a high temperature uh, material which I would consider to be an advanced material and I will actually give an example of this material at the end of this presentation and why this is very uniquely used in the EBM process. So let's move into the EBM material opportunities. So I have now described a little bit what makes the EBM technology unique and how you can can utilize it in an efficient way for for advanced materials. So we use, we tend to see the opportunities of, of EBM as a little bit of an iceberg. So what you can see and what is used today is basically where EBM is used for the high productivity. The fast moving beam, the efficient energy transfer makes the production rates with single source um, single source energy sources very efficient with, with EBM and where production rates are uh, consistently higher uh, with, with single source uh, uh, energy source based systems. Um, then also as I've been described, so there's no uh, need for stressful reliefs, heat treatments with, with EBM. Uh, we have the pure, purity of the process from coming from the vacuum environments and also uh, enabling the production of reactive materials. And you can see the examples I've just described here over the surface. But, but then below the surface, there are also, of course, of course other uh, properties that, that is per, uh, pursuable and of also other materials. So we come into reflective materials where we do see, where you do have limitations with laser-based processes due to the re reflectivity with uh, copper or, or aluminum. Once you get into multiple with these materials, they tend to reflect a lot of the photons or, or, or light energy coming from the laser. But once since in, we instead then have the electrons, uh, we don't have that limitation. Um, it's been proved that crack prone materials is also a group of materials that is uh, enabled by EBM since we have this elevated build temperature as well. And by being able to tailor the microstructure and mechanical properties, you can achieve superior creep properties, for example. And we do believe in the future it's possible to tailor the process to achieve single crystalline parts, for example. Uh, and once again, we have not seen the very, the, the deepest depth of this, um, this iceberg theory here with custom EBM alloys. And I will come into this a little bit later as well. So where we do you see some, some material opportunities um, in this iceberg theory is where we do see new opportunities below the surface is uh, with the application of tool steels. Um, this could be a, a reactive material uh, once it's it's under uh, uh, melt conditions. It's uh, dependent on what type of um, what type of alloy you do, alloy composition you have. It could be uh, very crack prone, 
and it's also possible to tailor the, the mechanical properties depending on how you evolve the microstructure with this material. So the market need for tool steels is, is to, to utilize additive manufacturing is of course to use more advanced geometries and, and to reduce the lead times. So you, the lead time for, for example, tool inserts can be quite substantial, but instead utilizing additive manufacturing, the lead types could be re, uh, reduced. And the current situation with, to, with uses of tool steels in additive manufacturing is that you're limited to with a low carbon content and hardness of, of the material. If you have higher carbon contents, the material tend to crack uh, with the regular, uh, mainly laser-based processes. So with EBM instead, it's actually possible to produce tool steels, high alloy tool steels, uh, without any cracking and fully de develop microstructures. So, um, uh, the, and this basically comes from what has been, what I've been described throughout this presentation. So the unique features of EBM with an elevated build temperature and vacuum process. So the elevated mill temperature makes it possible to produce this, these materials without any cracking. Um, and you can utilize, uh, materials or tool steels for hot, hot work. Uh, hot work applications, for example. And what you will get with the EBM process is they will have a fine and hom homogeneous microstructure, as we can see here on the Im image on the bottom. So a fully develop developed homogeneous microstructure. And this is in the application with this gear hub you can see here on, on your left. And what we've also been able to print the cemented carbides, where we do see a well distributed matrix, a well distributed uh, carbides within this uh, matrix of of uh, of the uh, oh, matrix material as well. So here we here we do see some unique features. We and of course none of these material we have been able to produce these materials crack free. So this is one enabler with EP. Um, another material is uh, that is an opportunity below the surface is the, the production of pure copper. So copper itself is a very conductive and also very reflective material when you try to, to, to manufacture it uh, with, command, with uh, other additive manufacturing processes. It's also, especially for pure copper that has a pure purity of more than 99.995% um, uh, any type of atmospheric reaction will to a large extent, increase the thermal and electrical conductivity of this material. So here we do see an opportunity for use pure copper with, with EBM. So the market need is for high purity uh, copper for electri electrification. So if you should put any, uh, any or most alloying elements into copper, it will limit the, con the electrical and thermal conduction of the material. So therefore you want to go for pure copper. And another application could be for advanced geometries for heat exchangers, for example. So the current situation here is that only alloyed copper, or mostly I would say alloyed copper is available for additive manufacturing. I know that there are some trials with green lasers, for example, to achieve pure copper application with, with laser. But e with EBM, we're able to do this uh, pure copper with the electron beam instead. So like I said, e, uh, copper with 99.9% pure, pure, purity, where you will have excellent um, uh, electrical conduct conductivity. So more than 98% IACS. Uh, you will also have excellent thermal conductivity of this material. And on the bottom, you can see some, some really nice examples of parts that has been produced with this pure copper uh, already. So heat exchanger, as we described, induction coils and also electrification components that is used to transfer electri electricity throughout advanced geometries. And both the tool steels and, and as I described before in this pure copper is material is materials that are to be available with EBM uh, as a dematerial development materials at the moment. 
Another opportunity that we see is on MAR-247, so a nickel-based super alloy, which is usually very crack-prone and hard to manufacture with conventional additive manufacturing. So uh, with EBM, we've been able to produce this material with low crack density. Uh, we will achieve a fully developed uh, and homo homogenized microstructure. Um, uh, and so there's very limited need for solution heat treatment with the material. And with hot acid stack depressing, you're able to achieve, to achieve uh, defect, completely defect-free material. But what is also really interesting with this material is, is that you once again can tailor the, mic the microstructure here. So here you can see an example of, of three different types of microstructure and manufacture with MAR247. So equiox grains, columnar grains, but also a tailored microstructure where you can actually see that we're able to tailor the microstructure in situ or on specific positions within the actual part. And apart from that, we're also able to tailor the aspect ratio of the actual columnar grains within within the material. So you can see that the the um, the lamellar sizes here are are different, uh, which is very unique. And this is important once it comes to to the creep properties, which is which is important with this material or applications for this material. And as you can see here on this image is a Larson Miller plot. And if you're not that familiar with it, it's basically a log logarithmic scale of, of the temperature on the x-axis and the stresses on the y-axis. And what I would like to show with this picture is that with EBM, with the Taylor microstructure, we're able to achieve properties that are on par with conventionally, uh, conventionally cast directionally solidified material. Um, in these two videos, I would like to show you, this is also MAR247, where I would like to show you that it is possible with EBM to, to produce very tiny features as well. So EBM usually has the reputation, rep, reputation of not being able to have great resolution. But this is an airfoil well where you have cooling channels. And what you can see here is what, that we spread water through these cooling channels. And these cooling channels are as tiny as 0 0.5 uh, millimeters in size. So they're very tiny. And then finally, uh, when it comes to, to other material uh, opportunities, so uh, we also see the need for tailoring of alloys for EBM. Um, so we would conventional cast material, which basically all the materials I described are developed for casting processes. We have not yet seen the, the start of development of specific alloys for EBM. So I'm seeing we're running out of time. So I would just like to finish off with this example of an industrial use. And many of you have probably seen this before. And this is for um, gamma titanium aluminide, a crack prone, very reactive material uh, that is used in industrial production today with EBM. And by utilizing different scan strategies, we're actually able to tailor the microstructures, as you can see here on the low parts of the picture. And this is an enabler with EBM. And this is in production today for turbine blades in the GE, Avi GE Aviation family, where the expected production rate is to have produce more than 60,000 of these blades uh, per year to put them in, into the air engine. And the application for this is for the G Aviation 9, 9X engine. And the due to the 50% uh, lower density of titanium aluminide compared to the conventional um, nickel by super alloys, you're able to lower, drastically lower the, uh, the weight of the engine, and which will of course also and make it more fuel efficient, which is important for, for the aerospace uh, industry. All right, so that was a quite fast end there.